Um, last time we concluded the discussion of rumor spreading on networks. Uh, this time we are going to uh, uh, start looking at another class of stochastic processes on networks, uh, this time related to, uh, uh, to uh, this time related to two um, related problems of averaging and consensus. So let me uh, start sharing my screen. Okay, so we are going to look at these two related problems of uh, averaging and consensus. We are going to start with averaging this time. Uh, but let me uh, begin with an informal problem statement. Uh, so we have a collection of agents or individuals who are represented by the nodes of a network. Uh, and each agent has a value associated with it, which uh, we can think of as representing an opinion or a preference or a belief that this agent has. Uh, and this value could be a label, uh, taking values in a finite set. So it might be a political preference for one of a small number of political parties. Uh, it might be uh, whether they are in favor of or against, uh, uh, say, uh, the Green New Deal. So that's a zero one opinion, <clears throat> or it might be a real number associated with, um, uh, uh, with, with say, a strength of uh, an opinion or a preference. Uh, okay, so these values can uh, uh, belong to different kinds of sets, either discrete or continuous. And the nodes interact with each other uh, and modify these values. So uh, what we are interested in is um, uh, how different forms of interaction influence how the evolution of these values. So we want to understand the dynamics associated with these interactions, and we want to understand the long-term behavior of this dynamical system. Uh, and we'll study both deterministic and stochastic dynamics. There will be uh, two kinds of questions we'll be interested in mainly. Uh, so the first is whether the values at the different nodes uh, either get close to each other or maybe even reach agreement. So in the continuous case, we'll expect them to get close to each other. In the discrete case, we'll expect them to take exactly the same value. So we want to ask under what conditions consensus is reached across the whole network. So the values at all the agents are the same or tending towards the same. Uh, and if consensus occurs, then we also want to know how long does it take for it to uh, occur. So how quickly do we reach convergence on a common value? So these are the two questions we are going to be interested in. Uh, and let me motivate why we are interested in this kind of question. Uh, so an early example of this kind of problem uh, came from the work of uh, Francis Galton, who was uh, one of the founders of statistics in Britain. Um, so he was visiting a country fair and um, uh, there was uh, a prize offered at this fair for guessing the value of the weight of a bull. So when Galton looked at uh, uh, all the guesses that different people had put into the pot. So you write down your guess and uh, put in your slip of paper in a pot and the one who uh, guesses closest to the true weight wins the prize. So when he looked at the guesses, he noticed that uh, they were very spread out. 
uh, but that the average value of the guesses was in fact very close to the correct answer and maybe it was even better than the winning answer. Uh, and from this he uh, suggested this notion of the wisdom of crowds that collectively uh, a population uh, knows more about any given situation than any single individual within it, and that therefore collective decisions could be significantly better than individual ones. Uh, in general, there is uh, not, this is not necessarily true. There may be no good reason to believe that there's always um, wisdom in crowds, but there are situations where this seems to be the case. And so that's one reason we might want to make collective decisions. Uh, and it's not only human beings who do this. Uh, collective decisions are also seen in many animals. So for instance, in uh, social insects, uh, honeybees um, uh, make decisions, hives of honeybees make decisions about where they are going to go and forage for nectar. Uh, and the way this is done is by a number of scouts going out in different directions to look for food sources. And they come back to the hive uh, and report the quality of the food source, the quality and distance and direction of the food source they have found. Uh, and based on the reports from the scouts, the hive reaches some decision. And how does this do so? Is there a leader of the hive who is in charge of making the decision, and maybe there is, but uh, uh, evidence seems to suggest that that's not the case and that decision making is somehow made uh, more collectively and democratically, though the details are still not completely understood. Uh, so, uh, so what we are interested in, and we don't think honeybees or ants can uh, make very complicated decisions. So uh, we want to ask whether there are simple decision-making rules at the individual level uh, that lead to, uh, if you like, optimal decision-making for the collective. Um, so that, that might be one question we are trying to understand, motivated by uh, the behavior of social insects. And in fact, even simpler organisms exhibit collective decision-making. Uh, bioluminescent bacteria, for instance, have to decide whether they uh, uh, expend energy to glow in the dark or whether they don't do this. And somehow this kind of behavior only uh, seems to occur when the bacteria are gathered in a collective which is uh, large enough or dense enough. Uh, and similar behaviors are, uh, and, or similar sensing of a dense collective is needed to trigger uh, other uh, chemical responses to the environment, not only bioluminescence. And this process of uh, determining whether there's a big enough uh, group to engage in a certain behavior is called quorum sensing. So bacteria are capable of quorum sensing and uh, there's interest in understanding the mechanisms by which they do this. And again, clearly these have to be very simple mechanisms and we want to understand how simple behaviors at the level of individual bacteria can lead to this collective uh, emergent phenomenon of quorum sensing. <coughs> um, more examples come from <clears throat> Uh, flocking in birds or schooling in fish, uh, which uh, were originally thought to be uh, uh, based on follow the leader dynamics, that there's a leader who decides where the flock moves and everybody observes this leader and follows them. <clears throat> uh, but this doesn't seem to be the case because many of these flocks are so large that they couldn't possibly see the leader or decide uh, 
who the leader is, <coughs> uh, and also the direction of the flow changes uh, uh, changes over time in somewhat unpredictable ways, and uh, it's not uh, it's often not the case that whoever's at the head of the flock is leading this change of direction. And we do want the such changes of direction to be possible in order to uh, uh, respond to the environment, to respond to predators or the presence of food or something else. Uh, so again, this seems to be a form of collective behavior rather than uh, uh, centralized behavior of uh, dictated by a leader. Uh, there's, we might be interested in uh, opinion dynamics on, in online social networks. So for instance, how does polarization of opinions happen and the formation of communities, distinct communities uh, holding dist, uh, opposed opinions, but rarely communicating with each other or how fake news takes hold and spreads and uh, then uh, is resistant to uh, you know, further evidence. <clears throat> so how that opinion is sustained within itself. So somehow these are examples which fall outside the scope of what we discussed. Here, there is no consensus. Instead, there's polarization and that's uh, not something we will study, but uh, uh, but it's also an interesting phenomenon in a related context. Uh, okay, and these are examples of things that happen out there and that we want to understand, uh, but there might also be things we want to design. So we want to design algorithms <clears throat> whose goal is to uh, aggregate information from a lot of agents and reach good decisions. So uh, one example is information fusion in sensor networks. So we have these small lightweight sensors of things like temperature or, uh, or pressure or humidity, and these are scattered around a building or an area and they have to detect something. So an example is detecting forest fires. You can have a large number of uh, 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 temperature and smoke sensors scattered over an area uh, and communicating over wireless links. Uh, now, if one of these sensors detects uh, something that might just be a localized problem, may maybe it's sensing high temperature because it's being exposed to direct sunlight, or maybe it's detecting smoke because there's a very small localized because somebody's having a campfire nearby but it's not a forest fire. So you want to uh, integrate information from a large number of these sensors. <clears throat> if you're going to trigger an alert saying, here's uh, a forest fire and somebody should go out and take a look at it. Uh, so that's a possible application where we want uh, uh, collective decision-making. A couple of other uh, examples uh, which are quite topical are consistency in replicated databases. So uh, blockchain is a system of, uh, it's a distributed ledger for keeping track of uh, uh, activities. So it, it's a distributed record where uh, activities are, uh, or transactions are added at different places in the record and they have to uh, spread out to uh, all the copies of the record. And sometimes before they, it succeeds, some other activity, some other transaction has to be recorded and then uh, has started being recorded elsewhere. And then we have to uh, ensure that these different copies of the database are consistent and resolve ambiguities between them. So we have to reach consensus on what's the correct uh, version or which version we are going to accept. Uh, so that's one example. And then uh, increasingly there's interest uh, in robot swarms of uh, 
swarms consisting of large numbers of very simple robots uh, which can coordinate in performing some complicated task rather than having a small number of highly sophisticated robots. So again, uh, collective behavior is important for these swarms. Okay, these are all uh, motivating examples of why we are interested in this type of question. And now we'll move on to a specific model. The first specific model we are going to study uh, is due to Dick Root, who was a social scientist, and he proposed this model of opinion dynamics. In this model, time is going to be discrete, so it takes values one, two, three, and so on. Uh, there's a collection of agents. Their opinions take values in a continuum, maybe the real line, maybe an interval within the real line. Um, and then uh, the agents interact to update their opinions and the interaction is as follows. So in every time step, each agent computes a weighted opinion, uh, uh, sorry, a weighted average of the opinions of other agents. So agent I, the opinion of agent I at time t plus one, denoted as xi of t plus one, is a weighted average with weights pij of the opinions xjt of all other agents j at time t. Okay, so in practice, of course, uh, in a large population, an agent won't be uh, typically be sampling the opinions of everybody else. They'll only be uh, sampling the opinions of a small number of uh, friends or neighbors. And we can easily represent that by making PIJ zero except for J in that set. So uh, that, in other words, we have implicitly the structure of a directed graph here. Uh, and uh, I, uh, agent I assigns non-zero weight to agent J only if there's a directed edge from J to I, let's say, or I to J, Dep depend. It's up to you how you want to orient this edge. Uh, but depending on that edge, there's a non-zero weight. Okay, and typically agents will uh, also have assigned some weight, possibly uh, quite a substantial amount of weight to their own uh, prior opinion. So they don't uh, change their minds hugely over a small interval of time. So uh, PII may also be non-zero here and typically will be non-zero. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, the representation of how the opinions evolve in one time step, uh, coordinate by coordinate, but more compactly, we can represent this as a vector. So if we let xt be the vector of agent opinions at time t, whose ith element xit is the opinion of agent i, then the whole vector of agent opinions evolves in a time step according to this matrix vector recursion. So this sum here is, you can recognize this as the matrix multiplication formula. So the vector of agent opinions at time t plus one is the matrix P multiplying the vector xt. So you should think of x as a column vector and the column vector at time t plus one is the matrix P times the column vector at time t. Okay, so now uh, we already stated one assumption about this matrix that it has uh, zero entries if i and j are not neighbors in some graph. The other assumption we are going to make is that this is a stochastic matrix. So uh, we, we may assign zero weights, but we never assign negative weights. We only assign po uh, positive or zero weights to other nodes. So we we have the weights may okay. So given a graph, given a set of neighbors, you could assign equal weight to all your neighbors, 
or you might think some are more reliable or more trustworthy than others, and you might assign them higher weight and less to the untrustworthy or unreliable ones. Um, but you never think anybody is so unreliable that you assign them a negative weight. Uh, so the weights are going to be non-negative and we'll also assume that they add up to one. Um, so you, you have uh, fixed, everybody uh, has a fixed budget of trust of total trust one, which they uh, split among their neighbors in some fashion. Uh, and so they just compute a weighted average of the opinions of uh, their neighbors and themselves. Okay, so uh, let me remind you that a stochastic matrix is a matrix with non-negative elements whose rows all add up to one. So the amount of weight you give to each of your neighbors, uh, these all add up to one. Okay, so that's the setup. Notice that the um, that this is a deterministic dynamical system, the matrix P is fixed. So given the initial values X naught, everything that happens here is deterministic. XT plus one is just this fixed matrix P times XT. There's no randomness, okay? Okay, and what's the question we are interested in? We want to know how these vectors, the vector of agent opinions behave in the long run. And the notion of consensus uh, or convergence uh, corresponds to asking, do the values X, I, T all become close to each other? So do they all uh, then converge to some constant C? In other words, does the vector as a whole converge to C times the all one vector? Okay, the, the vector, uh, each of whose elements is C. So that's the question we want to address. Okay. Uh, so this linear recurrence, linear recursion xt plus one is p times xt is easy to solve. And it, the solution is uh, the belief vector time t is p to the t times the initial vector of agent beliefs x naught. So what can we say about the long run behavior of this vector xt? Uh, that depends on the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the matrix P. Uh, okay, and let's denote the eigenvalues of P uh, by lambda one through lambda n. So here n is the number of agents, P is an n by n matrix. So it, it has n eigenvalues, some of them may be repeated, but it has an eigenvalues. Uh, and let's also order them in decreasing order of absolute value. I'm not claiming that the eigenvalues are real, they could be complex. Uh, so we, uh, so in, we can't order the eigenvalues themselves, but we can order their absolute values. So lambda one is going to be the largest lambda two, the second largest, and so on to lambda n. And some of these absolute values could be equal. Some of the eigenvalues themselves could be equal. Uh, but what uh, we are assuming is that the largest is strictly bigger than the second largest. The rest, among the rest, we allow equality, but we are assuming a strict inequality here. Suppose this is true. Uh, if this is true, uh, then uh, we can say the following about the iterates xt of the opinion dynamics. It turns out that for uh, uh, most initial conditions, I won't make precise what I mean by most or generic. Uh, the iterates xt <clears throat> uh, after suitable rescaling and you, the rescaling you need is by the eigenvalue to the power t, these uh, rescaled iterates converge to 
some multiple of the eigenvector belonging to this eigenvalue. Okay, so that's the long-term behavior of these dynamics. The vectors converge to some multiple of the eigenvector associated with the largest eigenvalue in absolute value. Hopefully you are all familiar with this already and I'm just reminding you of this fact. So we want to ask a couple of questions here. So we want to understand what the con under what conditions on P we can guarantee this first inequality to be strict. So uh, in general, you, you, this always you can always order the eigenvalues, but there may be equalities everywhere, or the first might be an equality, and there may be strict inequalities further down. <clears throat> But we want to ask when the first inequality is strict and that's saying there's a spectral gap. The spectrum is the set of eigenvalues and the gap here refers to the gap between the first and second largest and absolute value. So we want to know when that's guaranteed. And then we also want to know when the all one vector is an eigenvector with, with this eigenvalue because if that is true, <clears throat> then the vectors xt converge to a multiple of the all one vector, and that is what we want for there to be consensus. If they converge to a multiple of some other vector, then the, the opinions are converging, but they are converging to different values at different agents, and we don't have consensus. Okay, so those, those are the, so the, the questions we are interested in uh, reduce to questions about when uh, the matrix P has a spectral gap and when the all one vector is its principal eigenvector, the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue. Uh, and these questions are answered by an important theorem known as the peron frobenius theorem, which is what I'm going to tell you about now and in the rest of this lecture. Okay, so let's state this theorem. Uh, and we'll state this somewhat more generally than our setting. So let A be an n by n non-negative matrix, meaning that <clears throat> all elements of this matrix are non-negative. They are either positive or zero. And we suppose further that there is some uh, natural number k such that a to the k is strictly positive. Maybe a itself is strictly positive, maybe all its in entries are positive, uh, but typically this doesn't happen and we only uh, require the weaker condition that for some large enough k, all its entries are strictly positive. Uh, if this is true, uh, then the matrix A has a real, real is implicit, real and positive eigenvalue lambda, such that all other eigenvalues are smaller in absolute value than lambda, okay. strictly smaller. The other eigenvalues could be complex, their absolute values are smaller than lambda. Moreover, the eigenvector corresponding to lambda is non-negative, meaning all its elements are non-negative, and it is the only such eigenvector. Every other eigenvector either has mixed elements. If all elements were negative, it could be, you can multiply it by minus one and make it all positive. Uh, but if it's mixed, you can't do that. So uh, the eigenvector corresponding to lambda is non-negative, and all other eigenvectors are either mixed or have complex elements, so you cannot rescale them, uh, rescale it to make it non negative. Okay. okay, so that's if A satisfies this condition that some power of it is strictly positive. What happens if A is a non negative matrix, but there is no such K? Uh, then uh, a slightly weaker version of these two things is true. So then again, there's a positive eigenvector lambda such that 
all other eigenvalues lambda i have absolute value no bigger than lambda. So lambda has the biggest eigenvalue, it's the biggest eigenvalue, uh, but it may not be unique. There may be other eigenvalues which are equal to it in size. And in particular, the eigenvalue lambda itself may be repeated in this case. Whereas here, the statement that all other eigenvalues are strictly smaller implies in particular that the eigenvalue lambda has multiplicity one, it's not repeated. Here it could have larger multiplicity. Uh, okay, and there may be other eigenvalues, possibly complex, which have the same absolute value. Uh, and there's also an analog of the second statement and that says that the only non-negative eigenvectors are those corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda, the positive eigenvalue lambda. But now this eigenvalue may be repeated and so there may be uh, uh, multiple distinct non-negative eigenvectors corresponding to the different multiplicities of lambda. So that's the theorem. Uh, take some time to make sure you understand it. We are not going to prove this theorem. You can uh, look it up in textbooks if you're interested, but it is an important theorem and you should take some time to make sure you understand the statement of the theorem. What are the, and understanding a statement means understanding the assumptions and what assumptions uh, imply what conclusions. Okay, so now <clears throat> let's apply the peron frobenius theorem to the root model. Uh, the weight matrix P that played a role in the linear recursion describing the model is, is a stochastic matrix. <coughs> And that means that all its entries are non-negative. Okay. Uh, also the all one vector, the column vector of ones is an eigenvector with eigenvalue one. So to see that if you multiply P times the all one vector, what does that correspond to? What's the ith element of that matrix vector product? Uh, the ith element is the product of the ith row of the matrix P with the column vector of all ones. Multiplying the ith row with this column vector means summing up all the elements of the ith row. Uh, but by definition <clears throat> of a stochastic matrix, each of the rows adds up to one. So the ith element of P times one, which is the sum of the ith row is one. And similarly for each I, so the matrix vector product is again the all one vector. So P times one is one, which means the all one vector is an eigenvector with eigenvalue one. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we have found one particular eigenvector and the corresponding eigenvalue. And I want to claim that this is the largest eigenvalue, the Perron eigenvalue of the matrix P, and this is the eigenvector, corresponding eigenvector. Why is this true? Let's go back to the Perron Frobenius theorem. <clears throat> Okay, so the Perron Frobenius theorem tells us that uh, the only non negative eigenvectors are those corresponding to the largest eigenvalue lambda. Now, the all one vector is a non negative eigenvector. Uh, so, the corresponding eigenvalue lambda must be the largest, and all other eigenvalues must be smaller or equal to it in absolute value. Okay, so that's what the Perron Frobenius theorem tells us that the eigenvalues lambda i are all no bigger than one in absolute value. Okay, so uh, when can we further guarantee that there are these are strictly smaller than one? And what happens if that's not the case? Uh, again, from the statement of the 
theorem, we saw that this would be guaranteed if there is some k for which the matrix p to the k is strictly positive. The k power of the uh, stochastic weight matrix p is strictly positive. <coughs> okay, <clears throat> that's not terribly helpful. <clears throat> Uh, because how do we check this? We'd have to compute p to the k for all possible k. <clears throat> and there are infinitely many possible k. <clears throat> so we'd never be sure of the answer if we did this directly. <clears throat> okay, uh, so let's uh, approach this a bit indirectly. <clears throat> uh, P is a stochastic matrix. So it's the one step transition probability matrix of some Markov chain. And it's an n by n matrix. So we can think of the Markov chain as having state space one, two through n. <clears throat> uh, and my claim is that if this Markov chain is irreducible and aperiodic, then this condition is satisfied. Then P to the K is indeed strictly positive for some K. Uh, I'm not going to prove this assertion. It's not hard to prove, but this is the property we'll use. Uh, so if the Markov chain associated with the stochastic matrix P is irreducible and aperiodic, then the matrix P to the K is strictly positive for some K. Uh, and what can go wrong? Uh, different things go wrong depending on which of these two conditions is violated. So if the Markov chain is not irreducible, then the eigenvalue one is repeated and it has multiplicity equal to the number of closed communicating classes in the Markov chain. And it's a finite state chain, so every closed communicating class is recurrent. So the number of closed or recurrent communicating classes. So if there's more than one such class, then the eigenvalue one is repeated with the same multiplicity. Uh, a different thing goes wrong if the chain is irreducible, but it is periodic. So let's say it has period M, which is strictly bigger than one, so it's at least two. Uh, then all the mth roots, sorry, this is a typo here. Then all the mth roots of unity are eigenvalues. So what, what are the mth roots of unity? So look at the circle in the complex plane, the circle of radius one around the origin in the complex plane. So the number one is the point on the circle where it intersects the real axis on the positive side, minus one is the interaction on the negative side. And the mth roots of unity are m equally spaced points on the circumference of the circle. One is trivially an mth root of unity. And then the others are e to the i 2 pi over m, e to the i 4 pi over m, and so on. So you go an angle uh, 2 pi over m along the circle uh, m times. And these are your mth roots of unity. Uh, and so these are all eigenvalues of the matrix P if it has period M. And since these are on the circumference of the circle, their absolute value is exactly equal to one. Okay. So there are M eigenvalues with eigenvalue, uh, with absolute value one, of which only one, one of them is exactly the value one that we want. So again, this largest absolute value is repeated. And if either of these things happen, then uh, uh, convergence is not guaranteed, then things go wrong. Okay, so th those are the implications for the Dick Root model that uh, uh, if the weight matrix corresponds to an irreducible and aperiodic Markov chain, then good things happen because the eigenvalue one is isolated 
and strictly bigger than the absolute value of all other eigenvalues. So in that case, the iterates xt of our linear recursion converge to a multiple of the principal eigenvector, which is the all one eigenvector. That's the only principal eigenvector. Uh, so they converge to some multiple of this. Uh, we could ask what multiple C do they converge to? And that depends on the initial condition. And we could also ask how quickly do they converge? So that's what we are going to answer first. So if we sort these eigenvalues as lambda one bigger than lambda two, bigger or equal to lambda n and so on, uh, then uh, the difference between the iterates xt and this uh, and the limit that they are converging to, this multiple of the all one eigenvector, uh, this difference decays geometrically in t. So it decays like uh, essentially like lambda two to the power t. Lambda two is strictly smaller than one. So lambda two to the power t is decreasing to zero. Absolute value of lambda two is strictly smaller than one. So the t power of the absolute value is decreasing to zero. Uh, and essentially it's behaving like lambda t raised to the lambda two absolute value raised to the t power. That's the behavior of this deviation. Okay, I, I've stated it in complete generality a bit in a slightly more complicated way, but if uh, lambda two itself was strictly bigger than lambda three, then you could put lambda two instead of rho here. If this is repeated apart from this geometrically decaying terms, there could be a polynomially increasing term here. And so I have, uh, so, so all I'm saying is it, uh, uh, okay, you, you can interpret this for yourselves. It's a bit, uh, bit more complicated interpretation. Um, okay, when, when you have the simpler or more complicated interpretation boils down to whether you have a complete basis of eigenvectors or you have to look at generalized eigenvectors and Jordan forms, etc. So it's all to do with linear algebra. If you have a complete basis of eigenvectors, then I could have replaced this row here by the absolute value of lambda two, and this would still hold. Okay, so that's the first implication. So that tells us that the uh, uh, that the convergence of the iterates to their limiting value. Uh, happens geometrically fast. The error decays exponentially in T. Okay, and then uh, what is the value C? Uh, it turns out that this, to compute this value, we need to compute the invariant distribution pi associated with this uh, Markov chain, whose transition probability matrix is P. And we assume that P corresponds to an irreducible Markov chain. So the invariant distribution is unique uh, and that's pi and the value C and you should think of pi now as a row vector. Uh, so C is the product of this row vector pi and the column vector X naught representing the initial opinions of the agent. So X naught is the initial condition uh, and this matrix vector product of pi and X naught determines the value C to which the opinions converge. Uh, the proof of this is in your notes. This is very straightforward. And to see this, you just note that uh, the value, the, the dynamics are deterministic and the value pi times xt, the row vector pi times the column vector xt is preserved. It's, a, it's conserved by the dynamics. So pi times xt plus one is exactly the same as pi times xt. And so each of these is exactly the same as pi times x naught. 
and eventually they are converging to c times the all one vector pi times the all one vector is the sum of uh, the probabilities of being in all the states so it's one uh, so pi times c1 is converging to c and so that should be the same as its initial value pi times x naught Okay, so that determines the value to which these opinions converge. Uh, okay, so that completes our analysis of the root model. This is a very simple model of opinion dynamics. It was one of the earliest to be proposed uh, sometime in the 60s or early 70s, I believe. Uh, and um, Okay, and the main reason I introduced it was to tell you about the peron frobenius theorem, which is, uh, which is a very important theorem in linear algebra. Okay, so some remarks about the model. We already saw that it's very easy to analyze. Um, the kinds of questions that social scientists are interested in are questions about influence. So we have a collection of agents and they uh, they start with different opinions and they reach consensus on some common value, but, uh, but they are not equal in their influence in determining the common value. Some agents play a much bigger role than others in what this final value is that's reached. And their relative influence is determined by this invariant probability vector pi that uh, that we described then corresponding to the weight matrix P. Uh, so by uh, solving the global balance equations and computing pi, you can determine how influential different agents are. <clears throat> okay, a special case of this that you can work through is if uh, uh, the agents put equal weight on all their neighbors. So if an agent I has the number of neighbors is its degree in it in this uh, adjacency matrix and now we are going to assume that this is uh, uh, this matrix is undirected uh, so there's an edge between uh, if there's an edge between i and j it's present in both directions in the direction from i to j we give it the weight one over degree i in the direction from j to i, we give it the weight one over degree j. The weights are asymmetric, but we assume the edge is present in both directions. Okay, so if we took p to be that matrix, then you can show that the corresponding invariant distribution pi is proportional to the degree. So this should be proportional rather than equal. Uh, to make it a probability distribution, we have to normalize it. Okay, so the influence in this case is proportional to the degree of a node. And loosely speaking, if you think of this graph as encoding friendships, then the degree is the number of friends you have. And so popular nodes have more influence than less popular nodes, which is perhaps intuitive. So that's what this uh, theorem is saying in this context. Uh, okay, and th these are the settings we have analyzed, and then there are more challenging versions of the problem when the graph or the weight matrix is not fixed as it is for us, but it's evolving over time. That makes it complicated, and it may be evolving in a way that is random, or it may even be controlled by an adversary who wants to make it hard for the uh, group to reach consensus. So is changing the weight matrix over time to try and prevent them reaching consensus. So what can you say in such settings? Uh, and uh, for those of you who are taking uh, this unit at level four, so at MSc level, you have to do a presentation later on this term. So here is a list of references uh, related to this topic. Uh, have a look at these and see if you're interested in uh, presenting any one of these papers. Uh, so you can look at this uh, uh, slide later and uh, consider these papers. 
Okay, I'm going to stop sharing now. And that's the end of uh, this lecture. So uh, today we looked at a problem of averaging, uh, which was deterministic. Uh, and next time we'll introduce a problem where the values are discrete rather than continuous. In fact, they'll take values in a finite set of labels. Uh, and uh, that model is going to have stochastic dynamics and we are going to be interested in the question of uh, whether all the agents reach consensus on a single one of these finitely many values and how long it takes to do that. Uh, that's for next time.